<laughs> Philosophy is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the study of ideas about truth, knowledge, the nature of, and the meaning of life. While philosophy has a broad definition, the main idea behind the study can often be summarized as the pursuit and examination of truth, knowledge, and wisdom. Historically speaking, philosophy was broadly but tightly woven throughout civilization's colorful past, with one philosopher after another building on or refuting on the works of each one before him. Even through all the muddled confusion of every discussion, debate, and disagreement, the goal of philosophy, philosophy managed to stay afloat, a search for truth. Fundamentally, truth is a quality or state of being true. Truth, however, is merely a term we have assigned to a thing that is true. What does it mean to be true? Oxford Dictionary defines it as accordance with fact or reality. Understandably, such an inquiry leads to numerous questions, asking the conceptual and abstract questions such as what is the soul? What are the principal causes of motion in the natural world? What is existence or what is morality? So the philosopher starts his journey to discover the truth behind these questions, and in doing so, where will this journey take him? Christian thinkers such as St. Augustine and St. Aquinas would not have influenced society to the magnitude they had had it not been for the contributions of ancient pagan philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. All right, the question of, then presents itself, what was the influence of pagan philosophy on Christian writers? Did pagan philosophers touch upon truth, or were they uh, simply intelligent men discussing philosophical ideas? What ideas did pagan philosophers hold that impacted the thinking of Christian writers? What is the progression of philosophy from pagan writers to Christian authors? To best understand the answer to these questions, it is important to understand first the beliefs of pagan philosophers, and second, their relationship to the theology of the Christian <coughs> writers. In an attempt to find truth, the philosopher often turns to, ask, to answering the questions concerning the nature of the world around him, including himself. Uh, early Greek philosophers were certainly no exception. Known specifically for his work in philosophy and natural philosophy, Aristotle, in his work Nicomachean Ethics, discusses the nature of various characteristics of man, such as morality, virtue, and justice. Every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some, at some good, so the question for Aristotle is, what is the highest human good? Aristotle believed that happiness was the highest good, not happiness for oneself, but rather solely for happiness itself. Happiness, then, is an end. However, Aristotle understood that the definition of happiness differs from person to person. Some people, he says, only identify happiness with pleasure. However, Aristotle asserts that such men are worshippers of happiness, slavish in their case, preferring a life equal to animals. For Aristotle, such a view of happiness was not ideal because human faculties are far, or excuse me, are far higher than that of animals. Thus, a greater, higher idea of happiness is required. In order for one to live in happiness, Aristotle proposes that happiness is dependent upon something higher, something he would delineate to be appropriate virtues. However, to merely say that happiness is a chief good seems a platitude, and to understand what happiness is, Aristotle says that one must first, ascer first ascertain the function of man, or the reason for man's existence. As a result, Aristotle proposes perception or life as the function of man, but he quickly concludes that both are common even to plants and every animal, and so are not unique to man who is higher than both. The faculty of thought, on the other hand, separates man from the rest of the animals, for certain kinds of animals possess, in addition, certain power, and still another order of animate beings, that is man, the power of thought, that is mind. Thought, therefore, is essential to what defines man, for it, um, excuse me, for, thought, therefore, is essential to what defines man, for as Descartes would later famously write, je pense donc je suis. The ability of thought was considered to be what Aristotle called the psychic powers, that is, the ability of beings with souls. Um, uh, Aristotle formulates that the function of man is an activity of soul which implies rational principle. Just as, a lyre player, uh, just as a lyre player and a good lyre player have similar functions, namely to play the lyre, they differ in the <coughs> function, uh, excuse me, they differ in that the function of a lyre player is to play the lyre and that of a good lyre player is to play the lyre well. Similarly, the function of man is to live a certain kind of life, but the function of a good man is to live a certain kind of life well. This leads Aristotle to the discussion of virtue and vice, because human good turns out to be activity of soul in accordance with virtue. In summary, Aristotle believed that the function of man is to live, but the function of a good man is to live well. Perhaps the best known analogy for the discussion of virtue and vice comes from Plato's analogy of, of the chariot, or excuse me, of the soul, with his picture of the charioteer vying to keep his winged chariot afloat and on the path. This charioteer has two winged horses at the front of his chariot, one black horse and one white horse. The black horse represents, represents that of irrational passions and other evils, whereas the white horse represents that which is rational, moral, and other good and noble things. 
Each horse pulls towards its own desires, namely the white horse pulling towards that which is good and the black horse pulling towards that which is evil. The horses represent the human soul with the charioteer controlling the horses. Likewise, the soul has both a white horse and a black horse, each telling the soul what to do. On the soul's journey upward, the white horse constantly pulls towards virtuous things, while the black horse pulls, pull, pulls towards vices, making the task of our charioteer difficult and troublesome. Just like the charioteer must keep each horse in its proper place, so too must the soul rein in and let out both, keeping itself on track towards what is good. Keeping this balance between the horses, while easy for some, is difficult for others by reason, by reason of the heaviness of the horse of wickedness, which pulls down his driver with him. Hence, virtue and vice, or more specifically the balance of them, are an important aspect of the soul. Virtue and vice can perhaps be thought of more with morality, the idea of right and wrong, with, more, with virtue being that of moral excellence and vice, moral depravity. Like Plato's understanding of balance, Aristotle held that virtue was a, a, a mean between two extremes. Courage, for example, is only a virtue because it is a mean between two sides. The man who flies and fears everything and does not stand his ground against anything becomes a coward, and the man who, um, excuse me, and the man who fears nothing but goes to meet every danger becomes rash. Thus, virtue is destroyed by excess and defect and preserved by mean, and media stat virtues. To Plato, virtue could be categorized into main virtues, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. These virtues would later be termed by St. Ambrose as the cardinal virtues. Plato believed that without such core virtues, one could not be good, explaining in his work Republic, I think our city or person, if it has been rightly founded, is good in the full sense of the word, clearly then it will be wise, wise brave, sober, and just. In other words, to be good, Plato believed that those four virtues were necessary. Taking the ideas of pagan philosophers, prominent Christian thinkers like Aquinas and Augustine wrote their various works, often building on or combining it with aspects of Christian theology. Plato's idea of the cardinal virtues would later become an idea that would continue on as a topic with many Christian writers. St. Thomas Aquinas referenced both Plato and Aristotle on the subject of virtue. Like Aristotle, Aquinas saw virtue be something of soul, of the soul, for virtue to Aquinas is a habit which is always referred to as good. And as Aristotle put it, human good turns out to be an activity of soul in accordance with virtue. In agreement with Plato, Aquinas argued that there are only four main virtues, that is, the cardinal virtues. Aquinas argues that Plato's four virtues are the only fundamental virtues because when they are numbered in respect to their former principles, or in according to the subjects in which they are, we find that there are only four cardinal virtues. However, he would later go on to say that prudence is the principle of all the virtues. St. Augustine, like Aquinas, understood the legitimacy in Plato's cardinal virtues as well as the idea of virtue itself. However, he was critical of how the pagan philosophy viewed virtue. While virtue was undeniably a good thing, Augustine pointed out that the pagans had made virtue a goddess rather than understanding that virtue is but a gift from God. The idea of virtue and vice being that of a mean continues even through to Augustine. In speaking of his past and his work confessions, Augustine outlines the core issue of his sin. He supposes that it was his desire for nothing to love and to be loved. Not that love is intrinsically wrong, for as the Apostle Paul wrote, if I have not love, I gain nothing. Rather, Augustine distinguishes that it was his love went beyond the affection of one mind for another, beyond the arc of the bright beam of friendship to where he could not distinguish the like of true love from the murk of lust. Like Aristotle, to Augustine it was a lack of balance, too much love that procreated the vice that is lust. Augustine investigates Aristotle's idea of the golden mean further and reasons that his sinful actions are merely a perversion of an attribute of God. In other words, vice is the perversion of a virtue. He uses the example of generosity, a virtue, and squandering, a vice. The squanderer, while generous in his spending, does so in an extreme manner, making pretense of liberality, while you, O oh God, are the most generous dispenser of all good. Thus, while generosity is a virtue, without balance it becomes a vice. A vice, then, is aiming at a virtue, but missing and going too far. If there is one idea that lies at the epicenter of philosophy, it is certainly the question concerning the existence of God. Generally speaking, philosophy resulted in the idea of a powerful God. However, not everyone's idea of God was the same. Some farther from the truth, some closer. Homer, who was considered to be a historian of his day, writes of the Greek gods known as the Olympians. Throughout both the Iliad and the Odyssey, the gods played a major role in the outcome of the Trojan War and Odysseus' return to Ithaca. While gods such as Zeus were often referred to as the great and mortal king, or other names implying his power, such as the one who loves lightning or who drives the storm clouds, their power was seemingly limited to, what, to the power of what they called fate, as when Hector was slain by Achilles. Zeus considered saving Hector from evident defeat, but when Zeus weighed the fates of death of both Achilles and Hector on his golden scale, down went Hector's day of doom, dragging him down to the spring house of death. Other examples of the gods' evident weakness include both Ares and Aphrodite's defeat at the hands of a Greek warrior, a mortal called Diomedes. 
Homer also outlines a clear lack of morality the gods possess. In the Odyssey, Homer recounts a story told by the blind poet Demodocus about an affair between the god of War Ares and the goddess Aphrodite. While Hephaestus was away working at his forge, Ares with Aphrodite and Hephaestus' house play out love together and the gifts of Ares dishonoring Hephaestus' bed. Other writers, such as the theologian Clement of Alexandria, dedicated the entirety of one of his works outlining the moral depravity of the Greek gods, urging them instead to look at Christianity. He thoroughly delineates how the gods were blatantly portrayed by their own authors as murderers, liars, adulterers, and other reprehensible qualities. In Clement's understanding, the moral level of the gods was no better than humans, and that humans, while mortals, were no worse than the gods themselves, essentially proving little difference between gods and men. Um, as Clement, do, excuse me, as Clement does point out in his work Exhortation to the Greeks, some philosophers saw past the lies and faults with the Greek gods. And speaking of Plato, Clement writes, Well done, thou hast touched upon truth. Like Plato, many other pagan philosophers understood the folly of traditional Greek gods and would conclude that only one truly powerful being must exist. In addition to the philosopher's inquiry into the nature of man, philosophy also investigated the causes of the natural world. The question was always, what are the principal causes? In other words, the question of origin. To Aristotle, the answer would lie in the idea of a supreme being. Aristotle would further the idea of a supreme being, rejecting the notion of the Greek Olympians and formulating his idea of God based on his observations of the world, an idea much closer to truth. In his work Physics, Aristotle examina examines the phenomenon of motion. Through his observation of the world around him, Aristotle concludes that motion has a cause, for everything that, has, that is in motion must be moved by something. Just as there must be something capable of being burned before there can be a process of being burned, and something capable of burning it before there can be a process of burning, so too, must, so too must the thing that can be moved have something capable of moving it before there can be a process of moving, for all things are capable of causing motion and being moved. And if everything that has motion has a mover, then that mover must also have a mover to cause its motion, and so on, ad infinitum. However, such a notion is impossible because it concludes that infinite motion is passed through finite time. Motion to Aristotle was fundamental in the way that the world worked. This led Aristotle to question the origin of movement in the universe. Aristotle's inquiry into the idea of motion and its role in physics, even though a pagan and secular approach, eventually brought him to the question of a supreme being. Without modern technology, the ancient philosopher relied solely on observation and logic to conclude his thoughts concerning the world around him. Looking above him, the ancient philosopher noted the movement of the heavens. Every day without fail, the sun would rise in the east, move across the sky, and set in the, and set in the west. Similarly, the moon and stars moved across the night sky until once again the sun took its place. To the unadulterated observation of the ancient philosophers, like Aristotle, it seemed that movement is a principal cause in the natural world. Aristotle concluded that this movement in the universe is caused by the first heaven, which must be eternal. However, like all movers, it too must have a mover who sets its movement into motion. In other words, if the first heaven that causes motion um, to other things, then by logical conclusion, it too must have a mover that causes its motion. Further, the mover who moves the first heaven must also have a mover, and that mover must also have a mover, and so on. Finding no other way to reconcile that problem, Aristotle concludes that there must have been some first mover, or o u kino menos kini. This unmoved or first mover is the principal cause of all motion in the, in the universe and consequently responsible for the workings of the universe. Aquinas would also acknowledge the advancement of ideas and understanding Aristotle made in formulating his ideas of the unmoved mover. Aquinas, in fact, thought very highly of Aristotle, often referring to him as the philosopher. Other authors, like the Italian poet Dante Alighieri, speaks well of Aristotle in the first circles of hell, saying, I can see seated the master, that is Aristotle, of all of those who know, all of them gaze upon him, all of them show all honor to him. Aquinas expounds on Aristotle's unmoved mover, which he refers to as the first mover, stating that, for, that the first mover was always in the same state, but the first movable thing was not always so. Meaning that while the unmoved mover always existed, the first thing to be moved did not. The first thing to be moved by the unmoved mover, Aquinas says, was not merely change, but rather it was creation. That is the beginning of all matter. Aristotle and Aquinas would also find agreement from Augustine, where in confessions he would write, But besides yourself, O God, there was nothing from which you could make heaven and earth. Therefore, you must have created them from nothing. Philosophy's search for truth is like a river that starts thousands of miles inland, starting from perhaps nothing more than a dripping glacier. Possibly a question. Eventually, the heat of every idea and argument continue, and the dripping glacier transforms into a roaring river, racing headlong down and away, away into the unknown. The unknown of philosophy is the unknown conclusions to the basic start in the search for truth. 
The search for truth brought many philosophers to ask the questions about virtue, morality, existence, and causation. Along the way, the river picks up more thinkers and new ideas, but it still continues. The river of philosophy continues both, but suddenly it splits off into one, two, the three forks, each leading to new ideas and old conclusions. Old ideas and new conclusions. These ideas and conclusions of many of the ancient philosophers had a large influence on the way that many Christian writers would formulate their beliefs, their forks in this river. Sometimes they rejected pagan notions, but many times theologians would build on and expand their ideas. Sometimes these forks led to nothing more than a dead end, hindrance to the truth. But at other times, they led to an understanding of truth. Happiness to Aristotle was the highest human good in man, and is to be achieved not by pursuing self-pleasure, but defined by proper virtues. Virtues like prudence and temperance. Aristotle would later pick up, uh, excuse me, Augustine would later pick up on the idea of happiness in his work Confessions, where he, where he concludes that happiness is the aim of all life. He understood that the, the search for happiness in the worldly sense, having gone down that path, searching for happiness and pleasure in the world, only to find misery. Like Aristotle, he would come to understand that happiness isn't something more than just pleasure for oneself. It isn't something higher. To Aristotle, that was defined by virtue, but to Augustine, it was found in God. For happiness is to rejoice in you, God, and for you. This is true happiness. Instead of attributing happiness to virtue, uh, excuse me, instead of attributing happiness or virtue to God, instead they, as Augustine would point out, made virtue a goddess and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Like the way Aristotle's discussions of the world, uh, discussions would ultimately find its way to the discussion of God, so too does philosophy search for truth end. Aristotle would observe uh, motion in the natural world and conclude that a higher being must exist, a mover who is not moved. This idea would continue on, and Aquinas would write, this mover is God, the creator who was not created. And so the discussions move on, and the river continues strong, forging ahead and searching for truth. But like all rivers, it must empty out to the only ocean it can, the subject of a supreme being. Despite the forks in the river and the dams att attempting to redirect the flow, the river will eventually find its way to where it was meant to be. Stop. Um, I would like to uh, <clears throat> give things a little bit of levity. Begin with an image from one of my favorite movies, Elf. <laughs> and in the mail room, I, I'm familiar, I assume you're familiar with this movie. It's been a while since I've seen it, but... Okay, all right. Well, uh, in the mail room scene of this movie, um, uh, Elf himself uh, has uh, drunk a little too much with one of the other mail room workers, and they're lying on their back staring up at the ceiling, and uh, the mailroom worker, in a moment of uh, unneeded intimacy, is telling him all the bad things of his life. And uh, uh, Elf makes the uh, somewhat intoxicated remark that, you know, you just need to get with the flow. And the other worker applies back and says, no, I've been with the flow. I've got to get out of the flow. And in your paper, you show the you know, whole kind of history of pagan and Christian philosophy uh, as a sort of river that has flown through history. And uh, yet, if you look at something like the idea of salvation uh, by Christ alone, uh, this was an idea that had uh, a great deal of difficulty being asserted, uh, uh, particularly in light of uh, Plato's idea given the Gorgias of man needing to transform his own soul for his own moral action, and that needing to be continued in the afterlife. Uh, this led the church down a, a notion of purgatory, that uh, was very difficult um, to, um, uh, to resist and corrupted the church's understanding of the gospel. And finally, uh, it took Martin Luther to really fervently stand against this idea as it had become so corrupt that uh, you know, people were even selling places in heaven and buying their, buying their way out of purgatory. Um, also, uh, the, the, the understanding of the uh, geocentric universe. Uh, the church followed Aristotle. Aristotle believed that the earth was at the center of um, the universe, and the church followed his guidance in that, and um, got to the point where that was considered to be the Christian position, and the church got you know got it on the chin from Galileo and his types that showed no, it's really if you look at closer astronomical observations, uh, it's not true. And so you paint this great kind of flow of everything going towards God. However, don't we need to get out of this flow 
uh, pagan thought, secular philosophy to be able to establish not only scientific truth, uh, but also true Christian theology. Yeah, I would say definitely there is a part of that that does, but I, I think there is a part of pagan philosophy that was um, what you might call, you know, what you might say touched upon truth. Like, uh, there are parts, that, there are things that uh, Aristotle or Plato believed that was very much close to truth. Like, uh, Aristotle maybe, you know, Aristotle wasn't entirely correct in all of his thinking, but he had one, th you know, one thing correct that a lot of the other philosophers didn't, and that was that there was only one God, or what you call the undue mover. And so I think that things like um, salvation or um, Christianity would kind of, what you might say, be the end, and, they, and all those ideas were kind of pointing toward that, but kind of each one kind of missed an important aspect of that, and so their, what the, their ideas and what they believed wasn't entirely true because they missed uh, parts of that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Martin Luther really didn't like the book of James, and uh, James talks a lot about the necessity of us doing good works and uh, salvation through works. He called it that gospel of uh, hay and stubble, and actually thought it shouldn't be in the Bible. His uh, philosopher, his theologian friend Melanchthon didn't let him go that far, but um, if you look at the pagan philosophy and the ideas that are being put forward, uh, shouldn't we look at it as so much hay and stubble that will be burned up by the refining fires of Christ and that in order to bring ourselves to stand before God having lived well, we should seek earnestly all that is given in the scriptures and not be detracted by, as the Apostle Paul says, vain philosophy. I think definitely the basis of you know your belief in, in salvation, how you you know your worldview should definitely be based and have its foundation in the Bible. But I don't think that necessarily detracts from the uh, what, the wisdom we can gain from philosophers like Plato and like Aristotle. I think they have a lot of good things to say and things that I mean even I mean which is basically what my paper is about. But even what Christian uh, theologians like Augustine and Aquinas they would pull ideas from them and discuss those ideas. And I think. And I think reading them and understanding what uh, Plato and Aristotle wrote, it kind of helps us kind of shift, sift through that and understand well, what is true and what's not. And so I think it's important to, to know that, to be you know, more educated or have a better understanding, and I think it can help in understanding um, truth better. But I definitely think scripture should be the base and foundation of that, your worldview and salvation. All right, then, um, yeah, obviously, certainly matters of Christ, we're going to look to the scriptures and not to Plato, um, but uh, there seems to be so many other elements of life. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to go to the Bible for geometry, sure. but, uh, you know, what about principles of good government? Um, you know, uh, very oftentimes people see the, the Roman and the Greek tradition of um, Republican government, uh, the Bible doesn't even have the word republic in it, um, and divided government with uh, separate checks and balances on the different uh, uh, forms of government. Uh, and they quickly go to Greek and Roman sources for that political theory that uh, much of our democracy seems to be based on. Um, wouldn't it be better if even in something like that we can show that it has a biblical origin um, rather than having to go to Greek and Roman sources, which are, which are always going to be full of you know, the, the possibility of pagan error? Yeah, well, I don't think the Bible is necessarily a book that teaches us how to govern men or how to run a government. I don't, I don't think that was necessarily the purpose of the Bible, but I would say we can look to the Bible, such as um, in um, Romans, I think in Romans 13, that discusses you know, how, we, how we should kind of view government and things like that. So I think there are aspects of the Bible that teach us how we should respond to the people above us, but I don't... But I don't think it's bad to look to place people like Plato or Aristotle who spent a lot of time thinking about that and have a lot of maybe what you call, might call life experience and uh, understand and see how they thought government should be run. And if there's something that goes contrary to scripture, then we know what they're saying is, is wrong. And that's why it's important to know both. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlson. Other questions? David. Hey, first off, I like your suit. It looks awesome. I think uh, and tie too as well. Um, my question is, I I really enjoyed your paper, and I think that um, sorry, my question is, with the argument of the unmoved mover, yeah. would, do you think that all the components of that argument, you know, things are in uh, motion, um, things that uh, are in motion have a cause, 
and um, you know, going back to the prime mover, do you think that the components of that <coughs> argument are um, are complete and true? That each component, um, yeah. Do you think that the well, each component is true of, of the idea of the evolution of power? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there are definitely some scientific issues with his idea of motion. Like, I don't think all the movement we see in the world causes everything, or that you know that, that I don't think the stars move around the world. Earth either. There, there, there are modern things that we know today that kind of detract from the validity of his argument. But I would say that the, the maybe what you might call the idea behind it that like motion must have some, like if something's in motion, there must be something to move it, and then that kind of goes on out of and it's kind of a, an infinite regression type thing. I think that definitely has logical you know, validity to it. Um, I don't know, I, 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 think it, I think it's valid. I think he has a good point, because honestly, I don't see, uh, besides believing that there must have been something that we can't explain to begin all of motion, or as Aquinas would put it, to create something without being created. Um, I think that's really the only answer, and I think Aristotle kind of nailed the idea, at least, behind it um, pretty well, because honestly, I probably would have sat there and wondered why, how things go on forever. So, yeah. so you think that it's a pretty good proof um, to use for the existence of God, like um, in like a philosophy class or in um, discussion with uh, you know, someone who's like a science major or something like that? Um, well, I think there's a lot we can pull from modern science, but I, I, think, I think from where Aristotle was at, at his time in the scientific history, I think he did a pretty good job. So, I don't know if I, can, I would say that I would use that as my best argument for the existence of God, but sure, I think it's in all books. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in your last statement, you did say, you know, just like the course, there were advances in the theory that would this kind of explanation for the being God. Are you saying that that's all of these different ideas and philosophies will come to judgment? Is that, is this, are you saying that they all are part of God? Well, how would you define it just that all of these come? Is it really fine for them? Are you going to find any way to permit to be judgment? Do you think they all are part of God? What do you mean? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, um, I think what I, what I was meaning by that was that um, all these ideas that many pagan philosophers who did not believe in God, they would discuss ideas that were not even related to God. But if you kind of look at ideas, a lot of them, not all of them for sure, but uh, many of them would eventually, you know, find their way to asking the question of, is there a, a, a being higher than us? And I think that's kind of more what I was talking about, not necessarily judgment, but more of the ideas will eventually lead us to a discussion of God. And it's kind of something that's inevitable. It's something we're going to have to face, and it's an answer, a question we're going to have to answer. Yeah. Speak up, please. So like, um, how would I respond to Descartes saying to build up your ideas from nothing? Um, I, well, I thought that was an interesting idea because there are, like uh, Mr. H would talk about a lot, there are like certain truths that we uh, believe or assume to be true, like the um, common notions, for example, or the, um, and the things in geometry. But um, while I think that that was maybe a, a good attempt, I would tell Descartes that I kind of think that there are some things we have to assume just because of our finite knowledge and where we are, I think there are some things we just have to assume. And so I would say there are some things in which we must, where we must start. I don't think we can really start from just nothing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was wondering how that fit in with the river. Oh, how that fit in. Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say he just kind of staked his own journey, kind of like I was talking about at the end, created his own fork in the river and just kind of went off and whether that helped or detracted from our understanding of truth. Um, I guess that's up to whoever reads it. Yes? Uh, you did a good job on talking on this uh, philosophy and how this become an art and a practice. But in regards to uh, some of the origins of philosophy, a question for you. Philosophy pursuing the truth. Um, 
did philosophy exist with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned? I, I have no idea. <laughs> That's really the best answer I can give you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. In regards to you saying it's a pursuit of truth, then, in, in their state in the garden with Adam and Eve before sin entered, is, was there a need for pursuing the truth? That's a good point. I guess in the garden, um, they had not sinned, so God kind of was with them. And maybe they didn't have a need or a desire to maybe have something like philosophy. But And again, I don't know for sure, but maybe with the fall, we were farther from the truth than that kind of and people had it, and I, and I desire to understand more. And and like I kind of, I, I kind of talked about this in my paper, but I think part of that perhaps started from maybe not even trying to understand God, in a sense, but trying to understand how the world around us works, trying to understand, you know, like uh, like uh, the nature of the world and how in physics and things like that, and that uh, that kind of eventually would lead itself to a discussion of God. So maybe it didn't start with trying to understand who God was, but it started somewhere else. And that eventually like that. Does that kind of make sense? That, that does. That was the second part of the question. That if philosophy then existed after the fall, from that moment, since since there is something in the world now that is not true, mm -hmm. so now there is a need to determine what is true and what isn't. And maybe possibly that's the origin of, of, of philosophy in our world, mm -hmm. of trying to just make that discovery for ourselves. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. it. Good. Yes. I want to go to the part where you talk about um, holding that virtue is a mean between two extremes. Courage, for example, is a virtue only because it is mean between two sides. The man who flies from and fears everything and does not stand his ground against it, and he becomes a coward, and the man who fears nothing at all but goes to meet everything and becomes rational. So, my question for you is um, when we talked, I think it was Aristotle, he talked about the different forms of bravery, of courage, the different forms of bravery. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to that, you know, someone who is just too ignorant to realize the actual danger, or someone who is doing it for uh, acting right for the wrong reasons, would you still consider that a virtue, or or is that on one other end of the spectrum of the actual virtue of courage? Or yeah, I would say that, like, um, for example, the example you gave of uh, someone who faces danger because they are ignorant of the danger that exists. Mm -hmm. I would say that would not be a virtue courage. You may label it as a type of courage, but I don't think it's courage in the sense that it's a virtue because uh, he obviously has no idea what he's doing. I think for it to be a virtue like a courage, someone something that we would admire. Like we don't admire people who just run around into the into like a dangerous situation because they have no idea what they're doing. We would admire someone who does it. You know, be, uh, they realize the danger, but they're doing it to save someone. Or they're doing it for a reason that's very selfless. And I think that courage kind of has to be that conscientious uh, understanding of the situation. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think going off of Olivia's question, when we say a virtue is a balance between the two values, um, how would you describe faith as a balance? Faith between the two is a balance. Sure. Um, I guess, I mean, faith is kind of uh, what I think it says in the Bible, like a, a trust in things and things. So I think like you could you could definitely have too much of that where you're just like overly trustful in things that maybe are not actually something you shouldn't trust in. Uh, like if I had a cardboard chair and I sit down and it's, I fall and I get up and I go to the next one and I sit down and I fall. Maybe I'm having a little too much trust in the fact that the cardboard chair is going to hold me up. And I think you can have, you know, not enough where you are, you know, paranoid and you're not trusting anything. So I think there, there can definitely be a balance of having two, uh, maybe in this case it's not, uh, it's not, um, you know, being, it's kind of like the thing where you're, you're, you don't trust enough or you trust too much. I think there can be, there has to be that balance between them. I don't think that answers your question. Yeah. Hey, good job, Matthew. Um, so, this past year, I did a history of science with Mr. Harris, and one thing that they distinguished is how philosophy began whenever people started asking why things mm -hmm. happen, like, um, why does the earth exist? Why is creation beautiful? Whereas, um, I guess, science and um, studying the earth is kind of, we've gone to this point of saying, um, how things work, mm -hmm. like uh, just observing the stars and meteors and stuff like that. So, does um, I don't have to understand, but um, does 
just asking the how, I just want to uh, know your thoughts on, just, just asking the how detract from asking the why or philosophy, and is there any way we can like, counteract that in this modern era where science is mm -hmm. um, um, Yeah, I think asking just the why and not the how is, um, there is a nice part of that because it keeps it simple. Like, there's not, we don't get caught up in all these complicated things and formulas like, it, you know, doing chemistry, there's all these formulas and stuff. And we understand the how, but it gets very complicated. And I think sometimes when we ask the how and we get into the complications of what modern society, modern science can tell us, we kind of have a tunnel vision, kind of, to speak, so to speak, and maybe we aren't focusing on other things that we should be, like, uh, you know, like maybe thinking about how it's happening. Uh, you know. And so I think, um, but I think the how is, is definitely helpful, but it has to be used appropriately, if that makes sense. Like you can't, you don't want to focus on it too much, but you don't want to focus on it too little. But I definitely think it can help us in understanding truth better because it helps, because it increases the amount of understanding we have. That is that. Yeah, that's great. Max. Um, okay, Matthew. So uh, you're talking about philosophy as a river. Yeah. And uh, as Christians, should the source of our river be God, or are we just supposed to use um, common notions as uh, pagans? The source of our river. Well, I think that when I um, I was more speaking of a river as in kind of how philosophy works its way through history. So, I, so you're asking like how would we kind of formulate our beliefs? I, I'm saying like uh, should God be our main assumption and then go from there? Okay, so you're saying or is probably in charge of secular? Just yeah, secular. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that, I mean, I think it depends on what you're looking at, but I think if you're looking at it purely from a certain group, it would help in starting with God, because that's kind of where I believe the pagan philosophy kind of had to go for, like I mentioned in my paper, is that, is that question of the supreme being, that question of God. So by starting from there, I feel, I feel like you'd almost have, like, so to speak, a head start on the pagan philosophy. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, ben, is that Ben? Yeah. yeah. So I really liked your paper. I especially liked the scene where it said that all virtues can be turned into um, into vices mm -hmm. if there's if there are too many of them, or if there's too much of one type of virtue. I thought about that a lot before, and I was wondering if there are any virtues that can't be turned into vices. Any virtues that can't be turned into vices. Well, I mean, I I I think you could probably take any good thing. I, I, maybe I shouldn't say any, most good things, and probably make them pretty bad. Like, I like the example that Mr. H always has given us in class multiple times of like the bank robber. And a bank robber has really many admirable uh, qualities. You know, they're smart, they're cunning, they're, you know, they, they're wanting to get money, which is a good thing, you know, be successful. And, you know, but, uh, but they go about it in, a, in a, an evil manner. They, they take that, those good qualities, and they put their good qualities, they, they take their good desires, and they take their good qualities, but they put them into a bad application, that is, robbing a bank. So I think, I, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that is good that cannot be turned into something bad, but I would say that most things could probably be made bad if you tried hard enough. Uh, yes? Matthew. So can the river, or has the river of philosophy actually reached the ocean of God yet? Um, that's a good question. Maybe not for everything, but I would say definitely for, for many topics like um, Aristotle's idea of the unknown, for example, like I gave in my paper, I would say, well, when I say reach the God, God at the end, and this is kind of going back to the question I was asked earlier, is more of the topic of God himself. So maybe not a fully understanding who God is. Like Aristotle definitely did not understand um, the nature of God completely. And I mean, I'm not saying that we do or anyone does, but I'm just saying he was farther from the truth than like maybe a Christian or uh, someone like Augustine who studied the Bible and things like that. But I would say he at least reached the the topic and the idea. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but and not also like, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that, does that answer your question? <coughs> Absolutely, all right, thank you. All right. That was an excellent paper. Well done. Um, kind of going off of that thought, when you are on this this river of philosophy following you throughout history, and you say in the very last line of your paper that the end goal is God and to reach God. Are you referring to like a 
that the goal of philosophy is to prove the existence of God, or is there something beyond just the the existence of God, like Aristotle brings up with his Hungry Um Is there is there a truth about God that we have to know besides the fact that God exists, or what is it we're searching for? Okay, I would say that um, that I mean when I would say the the end. So by the end, I meant more the that you know, like I said, the topic of a supreme being, the topic of God. But I would say, yeah, you could sit there and stay there, and maybe you'll be content with just knowing that God, that there must be a God out there. But I, I think you, sh- you, you can definitely should take that further, and, you know, understand maybe you look to Scripture, which talks about God. Wow, would you have to go to that? Talks about God. So maybe uh, definitely take that further. I don't think that has to be the end point. I just think that when I was saying that, I wasn't necessarily saying that was the end. I was saying that was like kind of a end to where philosophy kind of has to go, and it's kind of the, the beginning of an end, if that makes sense. Yeah, can I? Uh, if everyone is trying to get to this end of God, um, and everyone's going down this river, and you said people go down these different forms, if everyone's looking for this true God, but they don't know exactly what it is, how will they know if they're going down the fort? Okay. Because if they don't know exactly what truth they're looking for, how will they know if they, if they stop and they can't they, like, all the come out and find the end. Right. Um, I don't, um, which is one thing, I don't think everyone is, like, trying to get to the end. I just, um, rather, I think, merely I would say that it's um, kind of sort of an inevitable kind of, I don't think Aristotle was necessarily being like, I'm going to look at motion and today I'm going to prove that God exists. I think it was more of a kind of, oh, wow, there must be someone that exists. I, it was kind of more of the, the way his arguments flowed and it kind of inevitably brought him there. Um, and I don't know if that answered your first question. Then your second part was, um, how do we know if we're in a fork? Um, well, I don't think this river is kind of like a river that we might find, um, like a, a river in, in the Mississippi where we can have a map and we can look and see where we are. I think it's more of something that you kind of have to see, okay, and you, have, you guys kind of have to have something to compare it to. Perhaps that could be the Bible. Like, okay, is this idea I'm looking at, is that match up with scripture or is that, am I just completely off in some marsh somewhere? Then? Um, so I think kind of, if you have something to compare it to, I think a good thing to compare that to would be scripture. Does that answer your question? David? Um, so, since we're all talking about river, I'm wondering, <laughs> philosophy, since it's kind of like this, it's the search for truth and knowledge and wisdom, something we know is sure, would we, do you think we would be essentially river rafting if we take the Bible and what it says and use that to draw our philosophies from, instead of looking to find our philosophies from, oh, I, I believe in Plato, or I believe in Aristotle, or that's my train of thought. So, do you think that our philosophies should be, um, essentially like our foundation should just be the Bible. That's where our philosophy comes from because we know for certain that it is true. Um, so you're, are you saying we, should we should we as like believers start from the Bible rather than with pagan philosophers? Yeah, yeah, and sorry, I, I, and to add to that, the idea of river rafting where you can kind of go past other philosophies, you can kind of skip these Four. steps. Oh. Yeah, exactly, and so you can kind of skip the bumps in the road and you, instead of instead of trying to dog paddle through these different areas, you can just kind of have a fun time and sit back. And yeah, I definitely I definitely think you can um, just you know take the river as it goes all the way down, and that would be fun. But I think um, if I might say, for lack of a better term, more educational, we might say, if you do look at other ideas, even if you know that they're not going to get you anywhere, but to understand. Because obviously someone at some point believed that idea to be true. And so to understand maybe why he believed that was true. Um, and um, actually, I should probably answer the first question about should, should the Bible be a basis? Uh, I think as believers, it would be definitely helpful and more beneficial to begin there. Because that if, 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 if all the ideas of like pagan philosophers eventually do find their way to the question of God, well, then starting with the Bible, you've already skipped all that. And you've already started at the end. And does that make sense? Not saying the end as in the very end, but the end of maybe the beginning of more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I de- and then I definitely think you can skip those and the doggy paddles and going down the course. But I think I think you could definitely gain a lot of knowledge and maybe perhaps better ways to defend your position or whatever by having more education. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about this river so much, do you have like, a name for the river? What? Do you have like a name for the river? Or can we? Is there a nickname? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, I don't know if I'm a copyright. Can I? Sure. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Not bad, right? Okay. Um, 
not to stay stuck on the river metaphor, I'm so sorry, but <laughs> as a Christian, if we start with the foundation of the scriptures and that God exists, are we essentially going backwards down the river from where God is and knowing that God exists and then exploring all of these pagan philosophies that will, that will build on top of that? Uh, so you're saying if we start at the end and, we look, and then we go back right. to reading the books, kind of probably like we be going backwards. Um, I guess from a purely historic standpoint, yeah, you, you would be, but I don't, but maybe from understanding truth, I don't think you would be. I think that would be kind of that weird thing where you're going backwards, but you are advancing your understanding of philosophy and truth. Um, Mr. H. Yeah, I, when I was in seminary, one of the big debates was between the, what was called presuppositionalists and the evidentialists. And it's basically two different. Uh, kind of ideas about how Christian knowledge should be pursued. The presuppositionalists said, you know, their favorite verse was uh, the fear of the Lord at the beginning of knowledge, and if you don't begin by assuming the truths of all the scriptures, that knowledge is not fruitful. And the only way to come to knowledge is to begin explicitly with the assumption of all the truths of scripture. Uh, the uh, kind of favorite slogan of the evidentialists was all truth is God's truth, and you can begin anywhere in the whole scope of knowledge and you don't need to begin with the, a biblical foundation because everything leads back to the Bible. And so you can begin with philosophers, you know, whoever, just anybody that's ob observant and insightful and intelligent. Uh, if you just read them honestly for what they're saying and take them at their, uh, their uh, uh, face value, that you're going to find truths there that will, in, in the end, really just push you back to the Bible and ultimately to Christ too. Uh, if you... Um, in your paper, looking at um, the influence of the pagan philosophy on Christian, the, the development of Christian theology and thought, uh, would you tend to, uh, which of those two views would you tend to uh, move towards in understanding what uh, basically a fruitful picture of human knowledge is going to look like? I mean, I'm sorry, a fruitful picture of Christian knowledge is going to look like. Okay, sure. Um, I don't know much about either position. I haven't researched it, but I've been going off based off, uh, you know, speaking based off what you just said. I would say it's pro there's probably truthful aspects of both. Like I would say, um, I don't saying that you know I would I would say it's important to what you call assume the truth of the Bible, but I don't think necessarily assume is the right word. I would say you can definitely know that the Bible is true, and I think um, I don't think we it's something we just have to assume. Be like, oh man, I guess I have to assume the Bible is true. I think it's something we can know to be true. Um, but I think there are all the, there are aspects of the other. What, what do you call it, the ev evidential evidentialist? Ev evidentialist. I think there are aspects of that that are definitely true. That we can look to um, things that are not part of the Bible and reach conclusions that would be, be, that would coincide with the truth spoken in, uh, taught in the Bible. But at the same time, there are also you could also go in a completely other route. I mean, obviously, people have done that. People, atheists, perhaps have you know looked at things that are not in the Bible and gone completely different routes and have not ended up in understanding truth and believing in what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. So there's probably, my answer would be there's aspects of both that are probably true. Mm -hmm. and Thanks very much. Uh, yes. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. He knows some people who have perhaps ended with an understanding of a different God, not a God of the Bible, but like, you know, I don't know what God, but a different God, not one of the Bible. Um, uh, then, so basically the question is, how do you know which God you're ending up with, I guess, for lack of a better term? Um, I would say, uh, when I would say God here in this, in this text, it wouldn't be necessarily the understanding of the God of the Bible, but rather that a God does exist. That there has to be, like, kind of like uh, Aristotle was saying, Aristotle didn't understand the God of the Bible, but he understood that the supreme being, someone who is higher than us, has to exist. And that's kind of where you are. And I think that, in and of itself, is probably closer to truth than, let's say, the Homer and the Olympians, where they said there was a bunch of these random gods running around over doing what they wanted, 
not all of it could. So I would say, to answer your question, I would say it's not necessarily the true God, but it's the understanding that there has to be one God or one supreme being who is higher and more powerful than us, you know, all-knowing kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Oh yes. Um, so it seems to me that um, you know, through the the river going down. Sorry, just going back to the river, but um, no going down through, you know, ends up eventually gone. And you, you know, you're a Christian person, so it seems to me that you would definitely uh, show that uh, or believe that um, God is or loving God is a virtue. And I understand how that could be perverted in a sense of like Aristotle talking about. Um, in a sense of not loving him enough, but like uh, what Ben said, do you believe that um, it can be converted to uh, simply loving God too much? So your question is, can you love God too much? Yes. Um, well, perhaps that is the answer to Ben's question. Um, I don't, because like you could love something other than God, but if you love it too much, it becomes an idol, and that would be a sin. But God is God, so I don't think you can love God too much. I don't know. Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, God tells us that He loves it when we have questions because mm -hmm. He loves to answer them. So, uh, following the logic of your paper, you just sort of say that you know when we have theological questions, we should turn to philosophy to sort of reinforce that. So, my question is: Is it appropriate to answer your personal questions in your relationship with God with pagan philosophers? Um, I would say that would depend on what you're trying, what like, what pagan philosophy you're looking to to answer that question. Like if I'm saying, man, I don't I don't fully understand who God is, I wouldn't necessarily go to Homer and start kind of looking at that and be like, oh, this is what God is, you know? I don't, <laughs> I don't think that would be beneficial. So I, I think that's where it is uh, imperative that you understand what the scripture says so you can compare scripture maybe, or you can, or I should, I should put it, you can compare the philosophical ideas with the scripture and see where where the discrepancies are, <coughs> where, what's true and what's not. And I think that's kind of how you have to do that is compare it. Okay, and then the last question would be, um, what makes <coughs> an issue appropriate then? Like, what's the defining characteristic that would make it appropriate to be philosophy or just simply, you know, the Bible? So if you had, so then if I understand your question, if you had a, a, an issue that you were trying to pass with philosophy, what makes that issue appropriate? Yeah, because you, know, you said it depends on, you know, which one, what, what questions you have to answer with philosophy. So what makes it something worthy of answering it which is to be God alone, or what makes, is it, what's the characteristic that makes it able to be that, that philosophy? All right, yeah, I think I phrased my answer wrong. What I meant by that was um, it depends on what philosophy you're looking to define the answer. So like, if you, like, like I said, if you, I'm looking to understand who God is, I'm not going to look at Homer, I, I should probably read the Bible. So I, would, uh, I, I, phrase that, I phrase that wrong. What I meant to say was the issue doesn't matter is what you're looking to, to back that and to find answers. So does that make sense? It depends, yeah. like you should, it depends on what philosoph a philosopher you're looking to answer the question. Any other questions? Okay, so you said that you um, kind of have this idea of Christianity and like taking this Bible path down the road, to God, right? So, and then you have this other path of uh, pagan philosophy, and you have all these ideas and this search for truth, which ultimately leads you to like a higher being. You have this concept of a God. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, what is the turning point between knowing this concept of a God to coming to the concept of the true biblical God? Like, where do these two rivers converge? Okay, um, so let's say I have this idea of God, and my idea of a supreme being has, and I've concluded that my idea of a supreme being or my idea of a God has, you know, X, Y, and Z characteristics or whatever, right? I have my idea of God, and then there's the idea that, not the idea, but there is the God of the Bible, the true God, that the scripture tells us who, who he is. Um, I guess the best way you could understand where those two converge is if I can compare the two, if, this, if my idea of God, I guess, match up with the Bible, does that kind of make sense? Like, not, I would guess you could kind of tell if what if you were like a pagan philosopher, you were like, oh, I wonder if I'm if I just not discovered God. But if I have like, you know, if I if I have you know have this idea of, of what I think God is, you you could know whether or not it's a true God by comparing it with what the Bible teaches us about the, the one true God. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm just going to. I understand that uh, this concept of a monotheistic God mm -hmm. um, from the 
philosophy was foundational that Paul just didn't get left out of the Gentile world with all the other ones. But we talked about inspiration of ideas earlier. Do you think there was some divine inspiration in some of those early philosophers that God used to prepare the world for Christianity? Um, perhaps. I, I honestly can't say I know. But maybe there was. Maybe, maybe God did. And I, I think maybe that, that's a reflection of how he created the world. I don't know for sure, but like, if God created physics and God created motion, then maybe he used that to bring Aristotle, because he knew Aristotle would look at that, and maybe used Aristotle uh, as a love for that to help him understand God. I don't know for sure, but perhaps it was. Any other question that I'm missing? Oh, yes, sure. Um, so kind of going back to the beginning of your paper where you talk about um, the definition of philosophy as being um, basically a pursuit of truth. Um, the word philosophy literally translates to um, love of wisdom. So I guess how does that aspect of it, that love of wisdom, play into this um, kind of pursuit of truth, truth sorry, I can't speak, um, kind of throughout the river of history? So like, how does the literal definition of philosophy play into this, the love of wisdom? Um, I would say the love of wisdom plays into it because I kind of, I know philosophy has that definition that I provided, but I kind of narrowed down to a search for truth. Um, but I would say the love of wisdom is definitely important because I think having a love of wisdom, or at least wanting to understand, be wise, is important to understanding truth because I don't think you can be super wise without understanding what's true and what's not true. So that kind of makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. All right. Uh, at this point, if I can get all the parents to come in, we just got some details to work over for this afternoon. And uh, so, you know what? Uh, Shane. Uh, Chad, 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 you go ahead and tell the French to come on down. Uh, uh, okay, first, uh, let me just say again, thanks guys very much you presenters. Uh, it's a really lovely thing to be able to hear your thoughts and be able to see you express yourselves and, uh, you know, being here for the five years of watching you guys do all of your labors and seeing what it takes to get to the point to be able to clearly and profoundly articulate ideas. Uh, I know the labors that you have done, and it's really <laughs> lovely to be able to see you know, what your work produces. And I'll have to say, uh, for me, I, you guys are my work. And so uh, when you guys perform poorly, uh, I look worse than you do. So, I, and so I, it's just very fulfilling to me to be able to um, work with you guys and to see what you've done. And this is just a great way, I feel, to finish off your time, to be able to get up and show that you can read books, write about them, talk about them, and answer hard questions. So that's pretty much all the way to GPT. I wish there was something about glider throwing in there too. But, you know, so. All right, anyway, thank you guys very much. Uh, Okay, today, uh, it's going to get kind of complicated today. We're trying new things, and it's complicated, so please uh, just listen up. And we still don't have some parents here, so I'm going to do one more thing. Rochelle King, come on over here, girl. Come on. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you guys. Rochelle King, here she is. Michelle is teaching the GBT1 class this summer to seven boys, and I'm uh, very glad that she is doing that, and they'll be joining us in GBT2 in, GBT2 in the fall. And uh, she's also teaching a summer Shakespeare class, and if you guys love Shakespeare, you'll love Michelle. So she's great, and she's also just got engaged. So congratulations to Michelle. So, anyway, she is a, a great... Uh, great teacher, and I think uh, you guys will really enjoy working with her if you'd like to study some more Shakespeare. And I'm just really glad to see her. So she came came to the fling. She's uh, back in Annapolis for the summer, getting to enjoy St. John's College. Just finished two years there. And uh, so, great to have you here. Thanks for coming. Okay, now, uh, 
All right, so let me get all this stuff in my head. I hope I don't forget anything. Uh, okay, first thing, to get lunch, you guys, got to make a little team. One GPT-5 student, three. Guys, I really need you not to pump. Sit down. We got lots to talk about. Uh, one GPT-5 student, three non-GPT-5 students. GPT-5 student says, John 3.16, you guys reply it back, all right? With good expression. And uh, Rochelle and Christine, could you guys help me with that? All right, thank you very much. Uh, all right, so that's how you get your lunch. Now, 